Welcome to Money Talks, a series of interviews with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. This episode features John Myers, co-founder of London Yimby and the Yimby Alliance. John helps to lead a growing movement of mainly young people who want more homes to be built with the aim of making housing to both buy and rent more affordable. Yimby stands for Yes in My Backyard, a deliberate rejoinder to Not in My Backyard NIMBYs, who some blame for the ongoing shortage of homes in the UK. Thanks a lot for talking to us, John. What is a YIMBY? Well, YIMBY stands for Yes in My Backyard, which is the opposite of NIMBY or Not in My Backyard. And, you know, it's a rapidly growing international movement of volunteers and campaigners who believe we urgently need to do something about the housing crisis. You know, young people are faced with un unaffordable housing. They've lost the dream of being able to buy a home of their own. You see people crammed into five or six people crammed into a house that was originally built for a family. And the movement started in California and it's just grown rapidly since then. So this is a, an international phenomenon. They're, you're part of the Yimby Alliance. This is literally across the Western world. Absolutely, there's California Yimby, Yimby Action in the States. There are Yimby campaigns across the United States. You've got them in Australia, in Sweden, in Finland, all over the world. Now, you're a lawyer by background. You've worked in finance too, but now you're devoting yourself to this full time, aren't you? Unpaid, and you have been for quite a while. Why do you feel so strongly about this, John? I think it's one of the most broken things in our society, and it's, it's needlessly broken. It doesn't have to be this way. You know, it's, it creates incredible unfair outcomes. It damages growth, it damages opportunity, it damages people's lives. It even damages you know, choices like how many children they want to have. Um, women don't have as many children as they'd like, they say in surveys. And one of the reasons for that is cramped living space. And there's just no need for it to be this way. It has been better in the past. It is better in some other countries around the world. And we could do so much more on this front. A lot of people watching this show, they may live in their own home, they may live in um, social housing, council housing, they may live in rented accommodation. Tell us how bad the situation is for certain people in your generation, 20, 30, 40 somethings, who can't get on the housing ladder. As you said in your book, you know, over the last 20 years, the proportion of home ownership among the 20 and 30 somethings has dropped off a cliff. It used to be quite quite commonplace for a 25 year old to buy their own home and that's almost unheard of in many parts of the country these days and so what you see is in expensive areas you see five or six adults living together squashed into a house that was probably designed for a family of four and you know these are uncomfortable living conditions they're more likely to catch something like covid from each other and they don't want to be in that situation it's an insecure tenancy they'd rather have a place of their own they'd rather live on their own and so not just that, but there are people living far away from a job that they would have liked to take, but they can't afford housing near there. There are grandparents who love to live near the grandkids and they can't afford to. People living in, in dingy properties that don't meet standards because they just can't afford a better option. We see ourselves as a nation of homeowners, don't we? But home ownership in the UK is now below the average across the European Union, so we're no longer a nation of homeowners, and a lot of people that do own their own home are over 50 or over 60. Among 20 somethings, home ownership has plunged, among 30 somethings, home ownership has plunged. How much more acute has the shortage of homes become, John, would you say, over the last 10 to 20 years? I think it's become vastly more acute. This is, this is the most, if you ask younger people, what their biggest problem is, they will very often say housing. And you know, it's, it's becoming an intergenerational issue. It's pitting the young against older generations. That's incredibly unhealthy for society. So we've got to fix this, we've got to address it. And there's the affordability issue, isn't there, that stems from the lack of housing. The average house in the UK, the average house now costs eight times the average annual wage. You know, 240, 250 grand, the average annual wage being about 30,000 pounds. When I bought my first home in the 90s, I'm a bit older than you, it was four times the average wage. For me to buy an apartment pretty centrally in London was affordable on a young journalist's salary. Yeah. 
No longer. Yeah, and if you go further back, it's actually been getting worse for even longer than that. I remember talking to a partner at a law firm who lived in a Regency house in a squat in central London in the 1960s because housing was just so much incredibly cheaper back there. Now, I'm not saying we should have people back in squats, but over the last, over the last 80 years, it's actually got steadily worse. So from 1845 to 1939, wages grew nearly three times as fast as house prices. But from 1939 to 2016, the reverse happened. So prices grew nearly twice as fast as wages. We've gone backwards for that time. If you look at international comparisons of house price growth compared to wages in France, even in the United States, the UK is an outlier. Our wages have fallen so far behind house price growth. Our house price growth has been far sharper than almost any other country John, you've studied this problem in real detail. Why? There are a lot of problems, but fundamentally, we've messed around with a system that, that you know, used to work a lot better than it did. We're not delivering value for the people who want to live there, and um, we just have a system that doesn't work, essentially, and it hasn't, hasn't been functional for a long time. So we, we need to look at what works overseas and other places, what has worked in the past here, and change it. It strikes me we need about 250,000 odd new homes every year to meet our natural demography, and yet we've been building far, far fewer than that for decades now. Yeah. We haven't built two and a half million homes a decade since the 1970s. Right. And in the last decade, we built just over a million homes. So we're two or three or four or five million homes short. Yes. That seems to me the fundamental problem. Why aren't we building enough homes to either buy or to rent? I mean, ultimately, it comes down to politics, right? Many, there's, a, there's a problem of what you might call nimbyism, that people don't want more construction near them, and the current system isn't delivering enough housing given those political objections to meet the needs of the people who want to live in those places. And it goes even further back than you mentioned. You know, so since the Second World War, we've never grown the housing stock at the rate we did in the 1830s or the 1930s. And, you know, there's almost nothing else we do or build or make where we've gone backwards over the last 200 years. Well, let's just focus on the local politics of it. Tell me about some of your experiences as a card-carrying YIMBY when you've come up against opposition to local development? We try to have a no NIMBY left behind policy. People are human beings, right? If you're delivering benefits for their community and they can see that those benefits um, are worth it, then they're far more likely to support housing. And one of the challenges with the current system is that it just often doesn't do that. So you get new construction, new housing, which doesn't deliver the infrastructure. So it, they, people worry about congestion, they worry about pressure on health services, and we're not doing well at matching the new housing with the infrastructure to support that so that people can be comfortable that the community as a whole will be better off after it. Now, there is uh, a process called Section 106, whereby uh, local authorities are meant to be able to require developers to do certain things in return for getting planning permission, be it you know, putting a new road, sports facilities, playgrounds, and so on. It's my experience, uh, John, that those Section 106 agreements are often broached. They're often just not adhered to, and the local authorities are powerless or they feel powerless in the face of developers refusing to fulfill their Section 106 obligations. How can that possibly happen? Again, it's just not a, it's not a working, it's not a system that works. You know, the, the, the developers have lots of resources, they have an army of lawyers, they play these things called viability games, and they'll press in the courts, and they'll strip away all the agreements and commitments that were made, and the councils often don't have the ammunition or the staff with the expertise to fight that. Now, the government is trying to move in the direction of fixing that. We're going to have to see what happens on that front. And what do you think about the house building industry itself? How would you describe the house building industry in this country now compared to, say, before the 2008 financial crisis? How has it changed? Well, it's much more concentrated now. Um, you've got bigger, big house builders, often in an area there's only one or two real players in that area. You might call it an oligopoly. Um, and so that means there are very few. 
And that's, that's been a long-standing trend of reduction in the number of builders and developers playing. So back in the 1930s, you had lots and lots of small builders, and they've steadily gone out of business. And so we're left with these large house builders, um, which can lead to a range of difficulties. And it's a, it's a product of the current system. Indeed, after the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of small builders, medium-sized builders, SMEs that we call them, small and medium-sized enterprises, they got knocked out of the game, didn't they? They lost their bank finance, they went bust, they had to sell any land holdings they had to bigger developers. And you used the word oligopoly there. That was a word that was used in July 2016 by a House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee investigation into our house building market. It's quite a controversial word, isn't it, to accuse the big house builders of acting like an oligopoly, um, using restrictive practices, building slowly in order to keep prices deliberately high, not using all the planning permissions that they receive in order to constrain the supply of new housing in particular localities. I mean, it's pretty uncontroversial now, isn't it, that all those things are real, all those things happen? Yeah, I think it depends on the level that you're looking at it. I mean, at a national level, there are obviously plenty of players, but the problem comes when you drill down to a local level. And as you say, there's only a limited number of planning permissions. And developers are just acting like any other, any other profit-seeking company. They will do what maximizes their profit. And so if they know that they're sitting on the only stock of planning permissions in an area, they may choose to trickle those out to only build a few houses at a time in order to maximize those profits. I don't think it's, it's necessarily a negative thing to say that they're acting as an oligopolist because they're just they're responding naturally to the, the, the framework that the system puts them into. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't fix it. I mean, don't get me wrong, John, I don't begrudge a CEO of a company doing what he or she needs to do to maximise the profits of those companies within the law. That is their legal obligation to shareholders. That's how, that's how the law works. But I would say that the system itself is incentivized in a way, and it's structured in a way, that constantly delivers bad outcomes for ordinary people. Yeah. Tell us about the quality of new homes that are often built by some of our leading developers, John? Well, we've seen huge scandals from, um, I won't name them, but certain developers delivering homes which simply you know, were not acceptable in a healthy market where the, they haven't been completed or where pretty rapidly the plumbing fails or the wiring is incorrectly done or it's not even waterproof. Um, the original drawings or pictures on which it was sold don't actually match up to the reality. And people are understandably devastated when they've scrimped and saved and stretched themselves to the limit to buy what they thought was the home of their dreams. And they actually, it actually turns out to be, frankly, a pile of junk in some cases. Why is that happening? Why are big house builders putting on the market often substandard homes? Homes that don't have uh, legally required uh, fire prevention uh, materials within cavity walls, homes where the gable end wall is twisted, homes where if you look at uh, a builder's survey of them, they fail on multiple counts. Not all house builders and not all new build homes, some are good, but far too many Far too often, we're getting small, pokey, low quality, substandard homes being marketed in this country. Why? Well, from my perspective, I would say it's a problem of the system. That again, these, these builders are doing this, these developers are doing this because they can get away with it. And, and there's no real pressure. The consumers don't have enough power or... It's not enough competition. Exactly. You know, and so we've got to fix that we've got to enable more competition at the local level and but part of it is also just that these things are so expensive people are stretched to the hilt and they can't necessarily afford to to dig into getting the absolute best quality because they just need the, this this certain amount of space so what does the yimby charter look like obviously your aim is to get more homes built both to rent and buy for the younger generation what would you do how would you fix it, John? What are your sort of policy thoughts? Well, we're tenure neutral. So we're neutral between um, renting and buying. People should 
be free to do what they want to do, in our view. We're neutral between the types of housing that are being built. We're in favour of more housing, and the goal is to build the broadest possible coalition, and we have support from all political parties and from across society, from architects and planners to civic societies and residence groups. Um, but the goal is to push the system in a direction that actually gets communities in a place where they can say yes, where they can be happy that they know that the housing coming is going to be well designed, that there's going to be the right infrastructure provided and that they can see benefits, they can see that the, the people coming in are going to be happy and that it will benefit the existing community as well. Thanks a lot for listening to Money Talks with me, Liam Halligan, Economics and Business Editor of GB News. If you've enjoyed this episode, do please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube or wherever you're listening. Please do subscribe to this podcast and also check out my daily television show, On The Money. 1pm Monday to Friday on GB News or via the GB News app. GB News, Britain's news channel.